Yeah, so the following contains both descriptions and images of violence, drug use, and other kinds of adult themes. It's not intended to glorify or endorse such behavior, but simply describe it and show it to the best of my ability as a story as I think it happened. So if you're sensitive, weak, or one of these self-righteous jerks who likes to accuse me of doing that after listening to it, I recommend you go watch some Disney. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the Darkness Underneath Podcast. There are really two periods that I've identified with the Westies. I don't consider the Westies anything after Jimmy Coonan was permanently sent to prison and most of the members either dead or also sent to prison. The first period was from 1966 to 1977. That's the period we're going to be covering. And that was the Mickey Splane Coonan Wars. That's when Jimmy Coonan was feuding with Mickey Splane. People were dying and vanishing in the streets. That's when he put together the Westies, eventually recruited Mickey Featherstone. And it was during this period that he also joined with the Gambinos in an alliance. Although it wasn't really an alliance. That's what it was supposed to be. It was really the Gambinos making the Westies their bitch. Because after that, they basically just served the Gambinos as assassins. Sure, they'd still sell drugs and had their rackets on the side. But they couldn't even kill anymore without the permission of the Gambinos. At least they weren't supposed to. Now, I'm not going to talk about the second period right now. That's for 1988, while they were under the Gambino control. This is just dealing with the first period. And this will be episode 1 through 3 of the Westies and episode 7 of Roy DeMeo. I'll eventually have a Westies 4 and 5 to deal with the rest of it. But that's at the end of the DeMeo series. Now, in terms of guys of Irish descent were really three guys who were the most important people to bringing down Mickey Splane. There was also an Italian guy, Roy DeMeo, but we're just talking about the three Irish guys, and that was Jimmy Coonan, the guy who started the Westies, obviously, whose feud led to the end of Mickey Splane's rule. Then there was Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan. Now, Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan was never a Westie. He was a hitman for the Genovese, and he was a bad motherfucker. Thank Anton Chigar from No Country for Old Men except somebody you might actually want to be friends with if he's not trying to kill you. And Mad Dog Sullivan would be responsible for taking out Mickey Spillane's top lieutenants. Finally, there was Mickey Featherstone. He was Jimmy Coonan's top enforcer, his bodyguard, and second command in the Westies. And his fate with the Westies would be just as important as Jimmy Coonan's. Since this episode takes place between 1966 and 1975, you're only going to see Mickey Featherstone once. Jimmy Coonan didn't really have a relationship with him until 1975. They only met once, and you'll see that scene, but you're not going to see anything more than that. You're going to hear about him next episode. And Mad Dog Sullivan, he's not going to be in it at all, because he was in prison from 1966 to 1975. Got out at the same time that this episode ends. Now, this episode is going to cover the rise of Jimmy Coonan, in making the Westies and some of the lesser Westies. Jimmy Coonan was charming, focused, and intelligent. And unlike many of his criminal companions, he had two parents who had enough money to send him to college and give him all the opportunity he wanted. So where did his darkness come from? 
Now this is a question I will repeat during this episode next, to the point it might become redundant and annoying. But it is a question that really plagues me. Nobody's bloodthirsty sadism and sociopathic ruthlessness mystifies me more than Jimmy Coonan. He was often capable of being very loyal, but then the next moment he'd brutally murder a loyal friend, or frame him. Now, Jimmy Coonan was born on December 21, 1946, and he grew up in a five-floor walk-up apartment building on 434 West 49th Street between 9th and 10th, just a short distance from his parents' county firm on 369 West 50th. Grew to be a broad-shoulder man, bull-necked, burly, only five feet seven inches tall. He had a boyish face, a broad grin, and was often quiet. But despite his intelligence, he dropped out of school at 17 and began committing petty crimes around the neighborhood and leading the other juveniles to join him. And one trait that Jimmy was known for was his explosive temper. When he got angry, he really got angry, and he had trouble getting over it. And there was no moral consistency with Jimmy Coonan. The same things that he would get so angry about that he felt was so unjustly done to him or somebody he cared about, he would then do to others times ten. But being a hypocrite is useful in the underworld. Moral Hypocrisy Holding other people to a higher standard of behavior than you do yourself is really an important part of both politics and the criminal underworld. It's why people scream more loudly about rats than they do the guy who was squealed on, sold drugs to kids, or murdered for money, as if those guys were honorable. And moral hypocrisy is really an underlining theme of the Kunin Splain War that took Hell's Kitchen by storm. And that's where we're going to turn now. Back to the beginning of the Kunin Splain War. We're going back in time, back to early 1966, maybe just a day after Mickey Splain decided to kidnap and ransom back a terrified accountant to his family. Mickey Splain furiously slapped around John in his office for the second time in two days. He just found out his frightened family had been getting threatening phone calls at all hours of the night from this man, John's, two juvenile delinquent sons, Jimmy and Jackie promising that they were going to kill his whole family. Splain said furiously, You keep the family out of this! You understand? Never mind Mickey Splain hadn't kept John Coonan's kids, or his wife, out of it when he and his thugs beat up John and threatened him, emasculating the poor guy and ransoming him back to his family. That had been about business, and greed suddenly justified everything. Greed for this guy's hard-earned cash. As far as Mickey Splain was concerned, that should have been the end of it. Blaine might have even loaned John money back for the money he had taken, at extra interest, of course. But now this punk Jimmy and his not much older brother Jackie dared to call and threaten him and his family? They knew how powerful Mickey Splain was in Hell's Kitchen, how popular he was. Who did these punks think they were? Their dad, John, promised the phone calls would stop that night, and so Mickey Splain let him go. And the phone calls did stop. He presumed that was the end of it. It wasn't. It's was only the beginning. The beginning of a war that would lead to murder and bodies in the street and other victims vanishing altogether. So it's not entirely clear when the war began between the Coonans and Mickey Splain, specifically when it was declared. I have my hypothesis, but it is a topic I'm still trying to confirm. What is clear is that Jimmy and Jackie began recruiting immediately after their father was terrorized for the second time. More than likely, Mickey Splain simply heard after word got out that the Coonan brothers had declared war on him and that they were trying to recruit men against him. But Mickey Splain wasn't particularly concerned at first. After all, he had plenty of muscle to protect him. The first person that the Coonan brothers managed to persuade over to their side was a thug named Eddie Sullivan. Not to be confused with Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan, although it is easy to confuse the two. Blaine thought that Sullivan was trash, that he was trouble. And he was definitely trouble. And Mickey Splain absolutely detested that Sullivan was not only trash to him, but trash from Queens, not even local trash. And people from Queens aren't even that bad. Now, Park Slope hipsters? Oh, God. 
or people from Staten Island? Ugh. But Queens, they're a mixed lot. Anyway, so Mickey Splain wanted this guy gone. And Sullivan, feeling rejected because he was from Queens and resenting the fact that this guy and his goons kept troubling him, absolutely hated Mickey Splain. And it didn't take much to convince this really pissed off Sullivan to join the Coonans. They found winning him over to be pretty easy. But to beat Mickey Splain and his dozen to twenty men, it would take a lot more than Eddie Sullivan and the Coonan brothers. Maybe not if they had Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan, but this was Eddie Sullivan, and there was no relation. However, something that was useful about this Eddie Sullivan as a thug wasn't just his brawn, but he came with a lot of criminal contacts over the years. He used to do a lot of robberies, burglaries, stick-ups. He still was doing those, which is one of the reasons why Mickey Splain didn't like him. He was trouble. But he had, nevertheless, a lot of criminal contacts. So Eddie Sullivan contacted a friend of his, Bobby Huggard. Bobby Huggard was this large guy who was built like a buffalo, and he was a hardened criminal even though he was only 21. He had half a dozen felonies already, most of them for felony assault, which is a pretty big deal, although that kind of makes him a saint among these guys. And they met at a place called Tony's Bar on 73rd, a little above Hell's Kitchen. And they're together at the table. It's Jackie and Jimmy and Sullivan, who's doing most of the talking. Jimmy, who's always kind of quiet to begin with. He's the quiet, charismatic type. He's just kind of watching and listening. Sullivan then explains, It's this fucking Splain. We want to take him out. Huggard had recently moved from Queens to the west side on 43rd Street, and he was very familiar with Mickey Splain. He didn't have a problem with them, but he went ahead and agreed anyway. Eh, it's something to do. Now, Bobby Huggard also had another guy with him, a con, who was named George Seflita. George was Huggard's smaller sidekick, and he basically went around doing whatever Huggard did. So now that they agreed to work together, the new gang of miscreants began wandering around Hell's Kitchen, getting busy. They demanded loyalty oaths to different bartenders and patrons in the area, which I guess could work, but it seems like somebody could just lie in order to be left alone and then go tell Splain. They also decided they were going to raise funds, not just for the war. These guys were crooks, and most crooks love money, duh. And so they decided rather than to do it like civilized human beings, they went on a stick-up spree, robbing small businesses around New York City and causing hell. Although the first robbery at a bar in the Bronx went pretty easy, and they didn't even have to fire their guns. In the meantime... Allegations and rumors spread all over Hell's Kitchen, and Coonan managed to recruit a new guy here and there. Mickey Splain had decided he wasn't going to ransom or hurt Hell's Kitchen residents anymore. It was terrible for his PR, and it caused a major mess here. He even began restraining himself from violently retaliating against the Coonan brothers. But he was determined to end this, and as far as he was concerned, that Queen's Trash Sullivan was an outsider, so he was fair game. That's when word got out, which may or may not have been true, that a friend of Jimmy Coonan's who used to rob places with Sullivan, Bobby Lagville, had been ordered by Splain to assassinate Sullivan. Splain allegedly promised that the feud would end if he murdered Sullivan. He encouraged Bobby, since Bobby was a close friend of Coonan's, by saying, Get rid of this Sullivan. Then we can call a truce. Otherwise... Your friend Coonan's going to be history real soon. Now, the stories that Bobby Lagville was hired to murder Sullivan by Splain seems a little dubious. If it were true, then why on the night that Bobby was murdered did he agree to meet Coonan and Sullivan at all when Sullivan called? In fact, Bobby was last seen at the Pearly Saloon on 9th Avenue between 48th and 49th. And he was talking to Grote. He was also a friend of Splain's. And Grote said, You think it's a really good idea to go meet him? Bobby said, I got no choice. They called me. I gotta go. I'm not sure if that's good logic, but whatever. And Bobby, like a loyal friend, then went to see Sullivan and Coonan, who abducted him that night, 
took him out to Long Island City, and filled him full of large bullet holes. So Bobby was probably loyal to Sullivan, and he was definitely loyal to Coonan, and they repaid his loyalty and friendship with murder and betrayal. It was the risk you took when you were friends with both Splane and Coonan. By the way, I studied a lot of crime, I have a master's in criminal justice, an obsession with learning about it, older student pursuing a law degree, focusing on it. If somebody ever abducts you and you're being forced at gunpoint to an undisclosed location in a car, whether you or they are driving, just assume they're going to kill you, because I've rarely heard of an incident where that turned out okay. It's better to go ahead and just attack, and if you can cause them to crash on a highway, then you can gleefully enjoy that you're going to make them suffer too. Fuck dying as a victim. Now, I know why Sullivan was mentally fucked up, but you have to wonder about Coonan. Where did his sociopathic behavior come from? It's from a solidly middle-class family with two parents who presumably loved him. Hmm, who knows? The same's true with Jackie, who was, if anything, even worse than Coonan. When Splane found out about Lagville's murder, and Splane liked Bobby, he had some of his goons go out and find Sullivan. They grabbed him. They took him back to the White House Tavern, which you'll probably remember was Splane's base of operations and bar. And they had him beaten, but they didn't kill him. They let him go. So that didn't solve anything. It just pissed them off more. Then, when Mickey Splane was headed to a game of craps one night with about six or seven other guys, Jimmy Coonan popped up on the rooftop of a tenement complex and began spraying the street with machine gun fire, pointed where they were walking. The guys dived to the ground and began hiding behind things. They had to wait till Jimmy Coonan ran out of ammo. And one of them shout, Who the fuck is that? Splane then looked up and he said, It's that bug, Jimmy Coonan! Then, on another occasion, some witnesses saw Mickey Splane and Jimmy Coonan firing at each other in the street. So it was getting bad. Assuming that one was true. Hard to tell with all the rumors. But it could have been. Till Bobby Lagville's death, many of the Hell's Kitchen residents probably didn't know what was going on concerning the feud between Spillane and the Coonan brothers. But word of Bobby's murder, and who was probably responsible, got out, and it nourished a climate of fear. Soon many of the residents began taking sides, not that that meant much, since they wouldn't do anything to become involved personally. Jimmy, Jackie, and Joseph were beginning to really scare a lot of the old-timers. During the very eventful month of March, 66, when Lagville was murdered, Jimmy, Jackie, and Sullivan trudged into Pearlie's, the same bar that Lagville was last seen at, being warned by the bartender, Groat, not to go. Groat was a longtime resident at Hell's Kitchen. He knew everybody. He even was the best man at Jackie and Jimmy's father's wedding. When the trio entered, he probably had to struggle to conceal his nervousness. They looked about as pleasant and fun to be around at that moment, as an angry black mob is slithering in, pissed off because somebody had molested it. There were dark circles under their tired eyes. They looked exhausted, like they hadn't slept for days, weeks, maybe even months. From their lethal stares, they also looked fully awake, like something had possessed them, and they would never sleep again if they didn't have to. Although Jimmy Coonan only sold drugs, he didn't use them. His brother Jackie and Sullivan were drug addicts. And I think that something possessing those two that night included white powder and syringes to keep themselves alert, and because it felt good. Sullivan was particularly intimidating. He towered over the others with eyes that were so wide menacing, it looked like he expected Splane to come charging in with an M16 at any moment, but that he was sure he was ready for him. And his fixed expression, which matched those eyes, was so disturbing that it made it clear he was paranoid and homicidal. Grote already knew how dangerous these guys were. After all, he'd been with Mickey Splane the night Jimmy Coonan began firing at them from the rooftop, and at least two of these guys had shot and killed Bobby Lagville seven, eight times, and stabbed him too. After all, Bobby had been his friend and told him he was going to go meet Joseph Sullivan and Coonan right before he was killed. Not that that's something he'd tell the cops. You keep your mouth shut around here. It's especially bad to snitch on them. Rose spotted Sullivan holding a glimmering chrome machine gun between the folds of his dusky coat. At that moment, he must have been outright horrified, and he probably wondered if he was going to leave work tonight. These guys were about as mentally fit and in need of a machine gun 
as Genghis Khan had been for the atomic bomb. Where the fuck is Splane? Sullivan said. Grote didn't know where Mickey Splane was, but he did know that he had gone into hiding because of these three guys, and that they had been looking for him night and day for several days now. He was in here this morning, but I haven't seen him since, Grote said. Then Jimmy's older brother Jackie interrupted. Whose side are you on, anyway? What? Grote said. Jackie sneered back. You heard me. Don't you play dumb. Jackie, I'm on nobody's side. I, I walk right there in the middle. You know that. The frigid homicidal look didn't leave Jackie's eyes. The men drew back and murmured amongst each other, but Grote could hear the important bits of their conversation. He's a fucking liar, and we ought to get rid of him, Jackie muttered. Now, yes. T.J. English says that Jimmy Coonan then replied, although the phrasing is slightly different in Paddywhack than it is in Westies. In Westies, Jimmy Coonan said, No, he's neighborhood. He's good people. And in Paddywhack, Jimmy Coonan said, No, he's okay. Let him live. They were both written by T.J. English, but whatever. They mean the same thing. So, the three ticking time bombs left. Off to terrorize somebody else. And Jackie was so unstable at this point, it wouldn't have surprised me that if he had seen a six-year-old passing him on roller skates, he would have accosted him and demanded to know whether he supported the Coonans or Splane. So a few nights passed, and Bobby Huggard found himself hanging out at a bar with Jackie Coonan down in Brooklyn in Greenpoint. They both were carrying weapons they purchased illegally in Vermont. Huggard had a thirty-eight, and Jackie had a forty-five. But they weren't plotting together to go use them tonight to do any more stick-ups. No, tonight was supposed to just be a night to drink and relax and then crash at Huggard's ex-wife's. Hey man, I gotta go outside, but I'll be right back, Jackie said, hopping up. Jackie left and Huggard didn't think much of it. He was having a good time and really liked this Jackie with his duck tail and relaxed funny attitude. He wasn't so sure about that uptight little brother Jimmy of his, but Jackie seemed alright. As Huggard waited... That I'll be right back promise turned into minutes, and then more minutes, and then an hour, and it turned 2.30 and the bar was closing. Hugger became annoyed and wondered where the hell Jackie went. The bartender told him he had to leave, and he wandered outside and began sauntering down a few blocks along Greenpoint Avenue. That's when he noticed the flashing lights of police cars around the corner of a tavern. Suddenly, Hugger felt anxious and he knew something went wrong. Why were there so many flashing cop cars there? Something real bad must have happened. Huggard carefully crept closer to the police lights and quizzically peered through a saloon window toward the other side to see what was happening. Oh, what the fuck? Bobby Huggard felt his stomach drop faster than an elevator. Jackie was lying face down on the street with two cops pointing revolvers at his head. Apparently he just murdered a bartender. Later, Huggard would find out that Jackie killed the bartender while robbing the joint because, you know, it's just one of those things you do when you get bored and need some cash, and it's not something you're going to want to let your friend know because it's embarrassing. Unfortunately for Jimmy, that left him with two less people. Jackie. Well, he was going away to prison for a very, very long time. He actually died of AIDS in 1988 from drug use. Jimmy didn't use drugs, but Jackie used them a lot and sticking needles up his arm was bad for his health. So he won't be playing any serious role further in this story. But I just want to say one last thing about him. While I was researching him, to find tiny details, I saw quite a few posts talking about what he was like back then, and I believe these people did meet him because it wasn't that long ago, and these guys, just like the DeMeo gang, really were running all around New York City at that time. It's not like we're talking about Julius Caesar here. And so these people online, they said he was funny and laid back, and really not a bad guy. Now, I just don't understand this. It seems like if you act creepy, you're a bad guy, even if you don't do bad things. If you do bad things, and you don't have much of a personality, you're a bad guy. But if you do horrible things, but those things are horrible enough to be interesting, and you happen to have a little bit of charisma and charm, then people second-guess your bad nature no matter how fucking horrible the things you did were. Whether Jackie Coonan liked you, or whether he was as funny as Sam Kennison, it's really irrelevant to whether he was a good guy or a bad guy. If he impulsively murdered innocent people, he was a bad guy. He might have reformed, but at that time, he was a bad guy. Jimmy Coonan. I have a feeling that Jackie was probably fiending for coke or some other drug that night, and that's why he 
did that stick him up and shot the bartender while paranoid. Anyway, when Eddie Sullivan and Jimmy Coonan found out that Jackie had been arrested for murder, they decided to lay low for a few days. Not long enough, unfortunately, because tragedy would follow, but for a short period because Jackie was known as an associate of those two. But unfortunately, that's when the diabolical duo heard a new rumor circulating Hell's Kitchen that some assassins had come from the South hired by Spillane to take Sullivan out. And who cares if it's true or not, we gotta go take care of it. It was April 3rd, and the night was early. It was 8.30. Charles Candlestein was at the Pussycat Lounge he'd arrived at with the guy he just met, Jerry Morrills. They'd met over at the steam room. But when they arrived, they had gotten separated, and he didn't know where Jerry went. And if he never saw him again, it would be no big loss either. Right then, Charles's eyes were drawn like a magnet to this young, attractive Jewish girl in front of him named Karen. This had some potential to lead somewhere. She was just in from Los Angeles and didn't know anybody. Well, it might have had potential to lead somewhere. That was until Sullivan appeared out of nowhere and growled. See that stool you're sitting on? That's my stool. You see that girl you're talking to? That's my girl. Charles was confused, and he must have wondered, what the fuck? Where did this enormous rabid cock blocker come from? Karen, she didn't know what was going on either, and she just threw up her shoulders. Charles tried to be polite, but when that didn't work, they began exchanging insults, and Sullivan stormed away. Hopefully that'd be the end of it, but of course it wasn't. It was only the beginning. Like a shark that just won't go away once it tastes blood, Sullivan came back. When Sullivan returned, he had a police badge and a gun. A very large gun. And he said, All right, police business, you're coming with me. What's the charge? Just get your ass outside. Now, in a situation like this, a cop isn't obviously supposed to act this way or point a gun at you without evidence that you have the capacity to use lethal force and might do so against him. This Charles should have refused to go with them and requested he call in some of his plainclothes buddies and stayed exactly where he was at in the meantime, gun or no gun, because whatever that this Sullivan is going to do with that gun with you in a place where nobody can see is probably worse than what he's going to do with a crowd around you. Sullivan shoved Charles past the patrons and out in the street, where Jimmy Coonan had his acquaintance he'd arrived with, Morals, up against the wall where he searched him. Next, the two men were pushed into a small, compact car, obviously not a police car, which should have been a dead giveaway. More than likely, they were just scared, and it made thinking logically hard in that situation. The car then jettisoned off. <laughs> Sullivan looked back and kept his pistol aimed at him. Charles and Morals were squeezed between Jimmy and another recruit, and they began driving across town. You know, if you guys had 2,000 on you, we could settle this thing right now, Sullivan said. So that's what this was about, Charles thought. It was a shakedown. Well, he didn't have 2,000, which was a lot more money back then. It was about 16,304, according to the inflation adjuster calculator in today's cash. Charles said, I don't have 2,000, but I've got 40 or 50 in my locker over at the spa. No, that wasn't going to be enough. Over the Queen's Bridge, past Long Island City. Along the way, the driver turned around, taking his eyes completely off the road, as if the thought of crashing was unfathomable to him. And he said with a threat tinged in his voice, Are you sure you don't have any money? Charles shook his head no. They finally arrived at their destination, Calvary Cemetery. The white tombstones spread across the hills, 
illuminated in the dim light like giant macabre teeth, were then ushered over to a dark isolated area and shoved against the wall, where they were searched one last time. That's when Morales finally had it. He knew they were going to kill him anyway. Go ahead, motherfuckers! Right here! Shoot me! Right here! He shouted, pointing at his chest. Three gunshots pierced through him. Charles started to run, and he was shot too. Several bullets entered his abdomen. Another one struck his armpit. Charles collapsed on the ground, moaning, then went silent. The last thing he heard before blackness overtook him were the men getting into their cars, giggling. <laughs> The joke was on them, because it was amateurs' night that evening, and Charles survived. He not only survived, but he was fully able to ID these guys and provide the police with enough information to know where to go looking for them and what they appeared like. Coonan and Sullivan made a lot of mistakes that evening, but I'm not going to discuss them in detail because I don't want to potentially help some deranged asshole out there become a more effective killer. Coonan and Sullivan had already been suspects in Bobby Lagville's murder after the cops had asked around Hell's Kitchen and turned up with some information. Lagville's murder had just been 12 days before Morale and Charlie Candlestein were abducted. Two days later, four detectives are dispatched to Billy Murtha's apartment. The driver, as you recall, who a few days prior had helped abduct Charles and Morales. But this had nothing to do with that. So they knock, and Billy Murtha answers, and Detective Logan says... Wake up and get dressed. We want to talk to you about a shooting. God, these guys are involved in all kinds of shootings. So Billy agrees, and he goes back to the bathroom. As the four detectives walk in, and they're looking around, Detective Logan notices something interesting. There's a large shoe lying on the ground that's much bigger than anything Billy Murtha could wear. So he approaches the bathroom, and he hears a dog bark. That's when he draws his gun, and he says, Come on out. The door opens. Billy starts to come out, notices the silhouette between the shower curtains of a large man, and he yells to him, You, come on out too. Sullivan comes on out, and he's in his underwear. But that isn't enough for the detective. He goes ahead and grabs the shower curtain and pulls it wider, and there's Jimmy Coon in his underwear too. So either these guys have some kind of gay business going on, or they're up to no good. The detectives arrest them, suspicious that they were involved in another shooting, and it was on May 12th, just 37 days after the Candlestein morale shooting, that Charles Candlestein was wheeled into a courtroom and identified these guys. Now, because the justice system, back in the 1970s, was completely weak and pathetic in dealing with serious criminals in New York, given they had a detailed description of all of them by the eyewitness, they were able to put them in that location, and New York works by felony murder. That should have been a slam-shut case, and they should have been able to get at least 20 years for both those two guys. Jimmy Coonan managed to plea bargain down to felony assaults for a murder and an attempted murder, and he was sentenced to 7 to 10 years, and only served 4 years. So 4 years for a murder and an attempted murder. And he might as well have given Jimmy Coonan a hug before he was sent off to prison. Now, Eddie Sullivan had already been arrested twice before for felonies, so that made this guy a three-time loser in old-time language. And he was sentenced to life, so no more Eddie Sullivan. And while these two guys were being sentenced, Mickey Splain wasn't really paying as much attention to them anymore. He started focusing on the Mafia, which he considered a much more serious threat, for good reason. Even when Jimmy Coonan got out, he wouldn't show that much concern. Mickey Splain hated the Mafia. They had a long-running feud, the Irish and the Mafia, going back to the old days of Owen. When the New York Coliseum was built in the 50s and opened in 56, the Irish had to share the profits with the Mafia. The same was true with the Garden. Tons of money. They had to share it with the Mafia. This is our territory. The Italians got no business taking their pound of flesh, he groused. As far as he was concerned, sharing profits with them in his area was a shakedown. And honestly, it was a shakedown. The Mafia wouldn't have been okay with Mickey Splain coming into their neighborhoods and demanding equal share of the profit. The Mafia are bullies. Everything they do is a shakedown. 
if they're not dealing with you equally. One way that Mickey Spillane retaliated, since he couldn't retaliate directly, started kidnapping made men and demanding ransom. And the Italians actually tolerated it, so long as the ransom was never more than 10000 to the 15000 range. Mickey Splane wasn't the only guy to do this, believe it or not. And then they'd be let go. That's the other thing. Don't hurt them either. Unfortunately, something went wrong one day, and Mickey Splane had this guy, Sicardi, kidnapped by Eddie Kaminsky. But then Sicardi vanished, so Sicardi must have tried to escape, and Kaminsky had to kill him. And what does Kaminsky do when he kills somebody? He makes them disappear. He cuts them up. He throws them in the river. That didn't go well, and now the Italians are pissed. It's mostly the Genovese in that area, and the Genovese are led by Fat Tony Salerno, this obese, cigar-chomping Italian who looks straight out of some 1980s cartoon villain, like a stereotype of a mob boss. It's actually a surprise they didn't retaliate. You consider they've got 200 made men versus Mickey Spillane's 15 guys. But then comes along the Javits Center. They're going to build this massive convention center, which everybody knows about today, I hope. And it's going to be one of the most lucrative projects in New York City history. And Mickey Splain said, you guys aren't allowed at the table. You guys can be my junior partners, but we're in charge of this. This is our territory. And the Italians are furious. At first they agree, but they don't really agree. They're just biding their time. Splain's followers, they think this is suicide. They're declaring war on the Mafia. There's no chance they can win. So when Kunin gets out, many of them are going to go leak over to his side. So Jimmy Kunin was released in the fall of 1970, and he was a leaner, more muscular Jimmy Kunin. He'd been working out at the gym regularly for the past four years, and he hadn't eaten a lot, not any more than was necessary because prison food is disgusting and tasteless. Now it was time to find a job and make money. And although Jimmy Coonan was smart, he didn't have much in the way of formal education and skills that are going to apply to a legal workforce. On top of that, he had a felony record, so his chances of getting a good job with that on his record were pretty low. So he took a boring job as a carpet installer, but he couldn't stand it. It was just too boring for him. And within months of being released, he was hijacking warehouses, robbing liquor stores, and kidnapping local merchants like Splain used to do, including a known mobbed-up connected taxi broker in Long Island. It's funny that he thought that was such a horrendous crime that it was so despicable when Splain did it to his dad. But he didn't have problems doing it to anybody else's dad or anybody else. I'm telling you. Moral hypocrisy makes the criminal underworld go round. Anyway, that taxi broker with the mob connections was a disaster, and the victim leaped out of the car in handcuffs and ran down the street till he found a cop. And when Jimmy Coonan returned to Hell's Kitchen, he was arrested, put in jail, and put, was to be put before a grand jury. However, suddenly there were no witnesses, and even the guy he kidnapped decided he didn't want to talk. It was a culture value there, and you weren't supposed to snitch. So Jimmy Coonan was released, and he'd gotten really lucky, but he realized that time he'd gotten really lucky, and if he wasn't careful, he was going to press his luck and be back in prison for a lot longer. Late one night in 1970, Jimmy Coonan was sitting in the back of a crowded place on 47th and 9th, it's called Sonny's Cafe. Several friends were seated with him. Jimmy Coonan had only been released from prison weeks earlier. That's when a wild-eyed guy he knew as Mickey Featherstone rushed into the cafe from outside and shoved his way over to where Jimmy Coonan was after spotting him. He gave him an urgent, pleading look. Coonan waved Mickey Featherstone over to the bathroom, where they'd have more privacy to speak. What's wrong? Coonan said. I need a gun, Mickey said. Jimmy Coonan didn't even ask why. Mickey Featherstone was neighborhood people, one of his guys, and also he might be useful one day anyway. 
Jimmy silently reached between his coat and pulled out a twenty-five caliber semi-automatic like he was given a Christmas present to a friend. Mickey thanked him and swung around to leave. Hey, Mickey, do you need any help? No, man, I got to take care of this on my own, Mickey said. Later, Jimmy would find out that Mickey had shot a much larger guy to death who had been threatening him over at the Leprechaun Bar, right in front of the screaming and stampeding patrons. After that, Featherstone had been sent back to the Institute for the criminally insane. Still, Mickey might be useful someday if he ever got out, Jimmy thought. And he would be. Their futures and ultimate fates were as linked as Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Now, back to Jimmy Coonan. With the money that Jimmy Coonan made, he began loan sharking, which he found to be at least moderately respectable among the criminal underworld because, you know, people come to him for money. It's not like they don't know what they're getting. And he saved up. And he bought a bar called 596 Bar. So check it out if you're ever there. I'll leave the address in the back after the credits. So his new bar would make him some legitimate money. It was actually in somebody else's name, but it was his. So the distinctive yet dull yellow 596 Club was going to be Jimmy Coonan's new business and his base of operations. And this was going to be where his followers, his crew, hung out. And it already had a group of people hanging out there who were criminals who he could recruit from. So it was going to be the kind of DC comics to Spillane's Marvel. You know, they were moving in. They were three blocks away. They were competitors now. Let Spillane know he was there. And a lot was going to happen at that Club 596. A lot of very unpleasant things. So in the following years after Jimmy Coonan got out... He was once again getting a reputation as somebody dangerous and a kind of wild cowboy, unpredictable with his stick-ups and kidnappings. A few years after he was released from prison, between 73 and 74, a longtime resident and loan shark, Anton Luzich, approached Kunin at a local joint. Now, Luzich was of average height with a mix of a grain, goatee, and short beard. And he'd been born in 1919, making him in his 50s now. And although his 50s isn't exactly old, his body had betrayed him early, and he had a premature heart condition, making him unfit to enforce anything if somebody didn't want to pay. And to be honest, even when Anton were young and fit, he wasn't really much of a fighter then either. He always preferred to use other people as his muscle. He didn't even know how to fight, for that matter. Anton Lusich was looking for a partner who could be both his muscle and who was smart and who could share investments on loans with him. And he, in return, would teach that man the loan sharking business. And, well, Jimmy Coonan had a little bit of experience in that business. It was nothing like Anton Lusich, so they had something to give each other. And obviously, that was the man that Anton Lusich won for the job. Jimmy, you're a good kid. A smart kid. This cowboy shit is beneath you. Why don't you go in with me? Partners. We front the same amount. I teach you the ropes. Share my wisdom. All you gotta do is provide the protection. Hmm, okay. Sounds good with Jimmy. So it was around this time that Jimmy Coonan became infatuated with a local woman named Edna. Now, Edna was a woman who was a widow. She had two kids. Her former husband, before he died, her late husband, died of ODing. And one thing you can say about Jimmy Coonan was that he wasn't superficial with women. He didn't sleep around a lot. He preferred one woman. And when he finally found that one woman, it wasn't a model in which he might have been able to attract with his status and money. It was a lady who looked kind of like a water buffalo and had the personality of one, too. And she had dated around a little bit, but she was single as of this time. Her last boyfriend was Billy Beatty. Jimmy Coonan, who could sometimes be really polite, actually went down and asked Billy if it was okay. 
Jimmy went over to where Billy bartended, and during casual conversation, he said, So what's your status with Edna? Billy replied, I haven't seen her in a month. As far as I'm concerned, we're done. It's good to hear. I've been hanging out with her myself, Jimmy Coonan admitted. Billy replied, Hey, knock yourself out. That's when the two guys started relaxing, drinking, and Jimmy Coonan took the opportunity to persuade Billy Beatty to come work at his new bar, Club 596, and Billy accepted his offer. And so it wasn't long after that that Jimmy Coonan and Edna got married. He didn't like these long relationships. Jimmy Coonan also took Edna and moved out of Hell's Kitchen, even though that remained his base of operations. So by 1975, Jimmy Coonan was having a great time. He was a serious rival set to surpass Mickey Splain as the most powerful crime boss in Hell's Kitchen. He recruited most of the core members of the Westies now, Richie Ryan, Jimmy McElroy, Tommy Hess, and Billy Beatty. Soon he'd have Mickey Featherstone, but not just quite yet. He'd also started working as a bodyguard for Ruby Stein, one of the most powerful and richest loan sharks in New York City. He was kind of like the Myers Lansky of the Genovese family. Even though Fat Tony Salerno said to stay away from the Irish, they're dangerous and violent and unpredictable, Ruby Stein felt like he could trust Jimmy Coonan. He seemed like such a nice guy. He was very differential, and he seemed so respectful. He had no clue what kind of venomous snake he was dealing with. Now that Jimmy Coonan had risen in power in Hell's Kitchen, many of Mickey Splane's closest associates began doing business with him, including the ones that were still loyal to Splane. These guys weren't necessarily looking to betray Mickey Splane. They just saw that Jimmy Coonan signaled new opportunity. Jimmy Coonan, of course, is going to try to persuade as many of these guys over to his side as he can. And he wanted one in particular, Eddie Kaminsky the Butcher. Despite all the tough guys Jimmy Coonan had now, tough guys who would kill for him, having somebody who can murder effectively and make the body disappear without the authorities catching them is a very useful and rare commodity among the criminal underworld. Eddie Kaminsky, though, wasn't choosing sides. He'd gravitate between Mickey Splane and Jimmy Coonan, and he was friendly with both of them. However, in the summer of 1975, Jimmy Coonan would see opportunity to bring Eddie closer to him. Now, let's go to Billy Beatty. Billy Beatty seemed to enjoy his part-time job working at Club 596. He met a lot of people, and it gave him ears to a lot of events happening in Hell's Kitchen. That was useful to Jimmy Coonan. Billy was a spy. Unless he was just starting out and hadn't been doing it for very long, Billy Beatty was probably making a lot of money selling drugs and loan sharking with Coonan's name, since he was, after all, a Westie, in a position that was close to Jimmy Coonan. But he somehow lived in a flop house with a roommate, another Westie, named Patty Dugan. And even if he was making a lot of money, maybe more than most of us in 1970s cash, I could still see why he was living in a flop house. Both Billy Beatty and Patty Dugan, like a lot of the Westies, were junkies and pissing their money away on coke and heroin, and maybe gambling. I knew a Harvard grad who made six figures on Wall Street and lost hundreds of thousands of dollars and never had anything left because of those drugs. He had so many track marks on his arms he looked like a voodoo doll who lost all its pins. Nice guy, but very self-destructive. Anyway, so Billy, Patty, and another addict named Curly were oftentimes at that flop house doing drugs and trying to forget how hard life was. So Patty and Curly were really close. And they had been for most of their life. Now Curly, he wasn't a Westie. He was just a guy who was well-liked in the neighborhood. And even Eddie Kaminsky loved Curly. They'd oftentimes play Rhinestone Cowboy from the jukebox and sing together. Rhinestone Cowboy. Kaminsky gave Curly that nickname. Unfortunately, they were going to have tragedies that were going to play into Jimmy Coonan's plans to try to win over Eddie Kaminsky and bring him into the Westies. And these plans would lead to one of the most horrific murders in the modern history of Hell's Kitchen. It started around June of 1975. Another part-time bartender at Club 596, Charlie Kruger, was loan sharking in Queens, using Coonan's fearsome reputation, but not giving Jimmy a cut. 
Jimmy was furious when he found out about this. Homicide was in his narrowing, hate-filled eyes. He wanted to kill this guy. At first, he was going to kill Kruger. But then, he had a much better idea. One that was more utilitarian. He'd get his money from Kruger, and then some. And Kruger would be taught a lesson. Billy Beatty and Patty Dugan contacted Kruger one night, calling him up and said, Hey, we need to borrow some money. Come down to Club 598. Kruger, always eager to make some extra cash loan sharking, went right down there. That's when Patty and Billy overpowered him, tied him to a chair, and pistol whipped him over and over and over, not holding back, until Kruger's face was bleeding, gushing blood from his nose, his lip torn, his face bruised purple, black, and blue, swollen eye, and barely able to talk, his jaw possibly broken. They told him he better get money for a ransom fast, and Kruger better find it from somebody who had the money. And then they suggested Jimmy Coonan. Of course, this was all a setup that Kruger didn't know about. So they let Kruger call Jimmy Coonan on the phone at that bar. And Jimmy, of course, acting, reluctantly agreed to pay the ransom as a loan at five points, which was pretty high. Kruger was easily duped, and after that, not only did he eagerly pay Jimmy back that money, he saw him as his new hero and quit using Jimmy's name without giving him a piece. Now, fast forward a couple months to August. So one day, at Club 596, Jimmy Coonan's club, as you remember, Curly's horsing around with Patty. And his practical joke, he pulls out a pistol and points it at his friend, Patty Dugan, who's terrified. What the hell? His face turns white. But then he realizes that the gun isn't loaded. Everybody laughs. And Patty Dugan's terrified look transforms to rage. And he charges Curly, shouting, You pointed a fucking gun at me! Guys in the bar intervene and grab Patty Dugan and pull him away. Well, with a normal mature person, they'd realize that Curly didn't mean any harm. And they'd let it go. They're friends. It's not worth losing your friendship over. But Patty Dugan wasn't normal. His brain was obviously muddled by drugs. And maybe he was mentally defective to begin with. It makes sense that Patty Dugan wasn't normal. He was a Westie after all. Kind of whiny Westie, but a Westie. Later that night, Curly, he stand in front of his apartment. And Patty Dugan, not being particularly bright or self-controlled, decides that the solution to his pent-up rage is to walk over and feed Curly a thirty-eight to the temple. You have to wonder where Jimmy Coonan finds these rejects. Rita Mayo didn't exactly profile kids for their college potential, but at least they were smart enough to be highly efficient at what they did, and if they weren't, Roy would ghost them. Now, Jimmy Coonan, well, he seemed to recruit his guys from the nearest crack house full of homicidal sociopaths barely able to tie their shoe, or do much of anything else besides shoot guns and speedballs. Now, don't get me wrong. I have a lot of sympathy for addicts. I think it's a disease, not a moral failing. I'm making fun of the Westies and how they behaved with their addictions. Not every attic acts like the Westies. So the residents of Hell's Kitchen were horrified by Curly's murder, and it made it even worse that his best friend did it. Fear, fear for themselves, horror, disgust. Patty became a pariah. His roommate, Billy Beatty, cried, Why'd you kill your best friend? Patty didn't have an answer. I don't know. I just really don't know, he said. He missed his friend Curly a lot, and he immediately regretted his decision, feeling horrible guilt and self-hatred. He began doing more and more heroin and felt suicidal. And the neighborhood, while well, they were really, really pissed, people began talking about killing Patty. People looked at him with disgust. And everybody wondered why this neighborhood had become so violent and barbaric. But nobody would tell the cops that Patty did it. Snitching was bad. Getting involved was dangerous. That neighborhood liked judging other people. But they should have been judging themselves, too. They were complicit. Then one afternoon, a furious Eddie Kaminsky stormed up to Patty Dugan at the Sunbright Bar, where he was sitting, stoned. And he snarled, What kind of scumbag kills his own friend? 
Patty looked at him calmly with drugged eyes, reached into his jacket and pulled out a pistol, setting it on the bar counter. Go ahead. You can't make me feel any worse. Blow my fucking head off. Oh no, you're not getting away that easy, Eddie warned. But Patty Dugan, he'd already been a mess, and at this point he was an even bigger mess, and his craving for more and more smack was like a black hole. He'd do anything to feel good about himself at this point, to keep the guilt and self-hatred at bay. And that's when he came up with the stupidest solution he could think of. He'd made a thousand dollars ransoming Kruger. Coonan, well, he'd made ten thousand dollars. Patty decided he was going to kidnap Kruger again and ransom him back to Jimmy Coonan again, not understanding that there was neither a reason for Coonan to pay that $10,000 for Kruger, and it was only going to enrage Jimmy. And it's not exactly like Patty was in a place to defend himself against even a subway rat, let alone Coonan. So, predictably, when Jimmy Coonan got that call, he was pissed. He even called Billy Beatty and fumed. Do you know what that jerk buddy of yours did? He screamed. What? He got that fat bastard Kruger down at the club. He's holding him for ransom. Oh, shit. Well, I hope you know I had nothing to do with this. <sighs> yeah, he told me it was his own. Billy, I'm so glad you ain't got a piece of that, you know? I warned that son of a bitch. I'm not entirely sure Jimmy that night was really having an honest heart-to-heart -heart with Billy. Jimmy was a manipulative sociopath who was always thinking about himself and didn't care about anybody else. He already planned on doing what he was about to do, and he was trying to make sure Billy was on his side and would go along with the murder of his friend. So that was on November 16th. By November 17th, Patty had vanished. So late that night, little 13-year-old Hell's Kitchen resident Alberta Sachs was awoken by a knock at the door. When she answered, it was her uncle, Jimmy Coonan, standing there. Behind him was the bulky Eddie Kaminsky. Hey, we're just here to borrow some kitchen knives, Uncle Jimmy explained. He and Eddie Kaminsky plotted into the kitchen and took four sharp kitchen knives. But before he left, Uncle Jimmy thoughtfully gave his niece $20. Little Alberta didn't think much of it. She ambled over to the couch, pulled the covers around her, and went to sleep. An hour passed. She heard noise outside. Curiously, Alberto wandered over to the door and opened it. It was Uncle Jimmy again, with his sometimes empty and sometimes angry eyes. Uncle Jimmy was holding a green trash bag dangling from his hand. That's when she noticed it was dripping blood. What the hell is that? Eddie Kaminsky was the one who answered. It's Patty Dugan's head.